Good evening. My name is Miranda Kunis. I am a senior in the Equine Science and Management major in the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment with a minor in, Ger in German. I have been conducting equine nutrition research with Dr. Lori Lawrence. Today I will be talking to you about how equine nutritionists use a horse's feces to better understand how they digest their food. Horses are grazing herbivores, which means they consume diets primarily consisting of high cellulose forage feeds, such as grasses and hays. However, modern management practices often supplement these high forage diets with high starch diets. This is in the cases of horses that have an extreme energy output, such as racing thoroughbred horses. Both cellulose and starch are long chains of glucose molecules. However, they differ in the linkages between those molecules. Cellulose, its linkages are not able to be digested by the horse's own enzymes. So instead, the horse makes use of a microbial community that lives commensally in its large intestine. These microbes have their own enzymes that can ferment cellulose into a product that is usable for the horse for energy. Starch's linkages, however, can be digested by the horse's own enzymes. This occurs in small amounts in the small intestine. However, as what sometimes occurs is the horse is fed too much starch, in which case the enzymes are overloaded and the excess starch flows into the large intestine, where it is also fermented by those microbes. This can be detrimental for the horse's health as it disrupts the microbial community there in its balance and creates an acidic environment in the horse's hind gut or large intestine. To better understand this phenomenon and how it impacts the horse, we utilize a DAISY ANCOM incubation system. This incubator contains four jars that we use for different treatment groups. Each jar would contain buffer solutions and fresh feces collected from the horse. These feces provide the microbes from the horse's large intestine. In the incubator, the jars are kept warm at the horse's internal body temperature, rotated to mimic the natural movements of the horse's intestine, and oxygen is removed to, pr to promote the health of the microbes. Overall, this creates an in, in vitro experimental setup that mimics the hindgut digestion of the horse. Our particular question, though, was how does the decrease in pH that comes from fermentation of excess starch affect the digestion of the cellulose, the horse's main dietary component? To do this, we used this incubation system and specialized filter bags to study the digestion of these different nutrients. The pH in each jar was changed to a different amount, some acidic, some more basic. And then cellulose or Timothy hay was added to the bags and were measured before and after incubation to look at the digestion or disappearance of these substrates. You can see here the different pHs that we started at. The blue line indicates our most acidic jar at about 6.5 pH, while the green line indicates the most basic jar at about 7.6. Over the 48-hour incubation period, all four jars experienced a decrease in pH, suggesting that fermentation was indeed happening. However, what exactly was happening to the cellulose in each of these jars? If you look at the bar graph here, the blue lines indicate the digestion of the Timothy Hay forage sample, and the red bars indicate the digestion of the cellulose samples. As you can see, the blue bars remain about the same for all four treatment groups. However, you can see a difference based upon the pH in the red jars, in the red bars with the cellulose digestion. The most basic jar had the greatest amount of cellulose digestion at about 40%. However, as you go down in pH, the cellulose digestion also decreases, with the most acidic jar having about half the amount of digestion as the most basic jar. We can conclude from these results that reducing pH decreases cellulose digestion. In the future, we'll try to use different amounts of starch to regulate the pH and see how that correlates to cellulose digestion differences. So you might be asking yourself right now, that's great, but why do I care about what a horse eats? And for that question, I would remind us about how critical 
the horse is to the spirit of the state of Kentucky. But not only that, it's critical to the economy of our state. In Fayette County alone, equine-related assets make up a multi-billion dollar industry. So as we improve the health of the horse, we work to improve the well-being of our state as a whole. Thank you, and I can answer any questions that you may have. So I may have, I may have missed this, but how, how does it affect the health of the horse? So, so the, the fact that, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the, the cellulose does not digest properly, gets into the large intestine where it disrupts the other microbes. So what is, what is the impact of that on the horse's health or yes. the performance? Yes. So cellulose is always digested in the large intestine. And when the enzymes in the small intestine that digest starch are overloaded and they can't function, they can't take on any more starch, that passes into the large intestine. And that's where it gets more complicated because I mentioned it was a microbial community. So there's different participants in that community that function in different roles. And so when the starch utilizing bacteria uh, get all this excess starch, they proliferate and jump up. And they're taking over resources that would be used by the cellulolytic one, but they're also creating an acidic environment, which is not hospitable for the cellulolytic or cellulose utilizing bacteria. So it prevents them from doing their job because they're doing their job too much. But also, so that just makes it like disrupted and unbalanced, but these dis, uh, lack, the lack of balance can lead to other health problems that can like be detrimental to the horse, as in like it could, you would need a veterinarian, they could, what's called colic, which is an extreme gastrointestinal distress, which often horse owners know like your horse could die from that. Um, and if it's in, there's too much starch, it can create an, uh, um, a phenomenon called acidosis, where it's down to a pH of five, which we didn't even touch here. And in that case, like you just need extreme veterinary care. So while it creates less than optimal conditions and amounts like these, it can lead to the horse's death if it's fed in even more excess. So a better understanding of, of these processes, would that lead um, uh, uh, farmers to better feeding practices or different feeding practices? What would it, what would it tell them what to do? Yes, there's an education component, which uh, the College of Agriculture has extension programs that reach out into the community and like we have this research in the lab, but we need the horse owners and farmers to know the information. So there's that aspect of, Please don't feed your horse too much starch if it doesn't need it. But as I mentioned earlier, this is done a lot for horses like thoroughbreds or other performance horses that they need a lot of energy. And starch is a really um, easily accessible form of that. So we can use this information to better inform our management practices for those horses that need more, as such as switching to a high energy feed that uses maybe more fat instead of starch. Uh, so a different nutrient class or changes the management practices such as feeding throughout the day versus one time in the morning. And so there's horses that need energy from this source, but the way it's done can be detrimental. You're welcome. That, so you're uh, explaining what I was just thinking of, which is that um, basically the, 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 horse, the horse under certain circumstances, such as a thoroughbred on race day, needs the extra energy, and yet the feeding practices that provide that extra energy also may be likely to cause health problems in the digestion of the horse. So you're trying to figure out how to have your cake and eat it too, <laughs> yes. or something <laughs> like that, right? For, the <laughs> for, for our equine friends. Um, so uh, uh, would, it, would this be similar with other animals that are related to the horse, like for donkeys and so on? Presumably they have the pretty much a similar um, digestive tract with some of the same issues and problems. Yeah, so donkeys are also equids, equines. Sure. Uh, so very similar. Uh, donkeys are so much hardier. We have a professor who studies them across the globe in different mm -hmm. working environments. and. Donkeys can survive on so much. So that would definitely be the case, but um, they might not have as many, like, as much energy output. Um, the cool thing about animal science and nutrition, though, is that beyond, like, equine, uh, you know, like, in cattle or in, uh, those are also called ruminant animals, so that includes sheep and goats. And then in pigs, like, everything is so different. Like, the, they all have the same components for the most part in their digestive tracts, but their function and needs are so different. So 
yes, a lot of this would apply to a donkey or a, perhaps a mule, but it'd be vastly different for a cow. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the paper. Uh, I really don't want to sound flippant, but I'm going to. <laughs> yes. Because um, I know, I can't think of an example now, but I know that not, not animals can flatulate. Can a horse toot? <laughs> yes, I work on a farm, and yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, we, had, we had sheep, so um, I knew they did. Um, because that, I was thinking about the gastric distress. Yes. So your suggestion here is that, that the, the impact of this study is, is not to give them Tums to you know, increase the, the pH and so forth, but rather to really adjust the diet on the front end. And, um, and, and what would, when you talk about cellulose, I think yeah. you have paper there as an example of that. Yes. What, what, what would they be actually, what would the feed actually be that, that is a cellulose-based diet? Yes. So your first question, um, I totally blank. Can you repeat the first part? You had two oh, parts Oh, I there. was talking about tooting. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I was saying that, so you're, you're, you're recommending that they would simply change the diet, not that you would add uh, yes. something to it, like a yes. Tums for horses. And then what was cellulose components? So yeah, so I've had the, uh, the question about Tums in the preliminary round, and I think that's a great example. Oh, I'm not very creative. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so Tums would, would provide a buffer. However, that acts in the horse's stomach and where it's in the acidic environment. And there's actually neutral, pH neutralizing uh, mechanisms in the horse's small intestine. So because we're feeding this front end, that it's causing problems that can't be reversed by something like Tums that acts in the stomach. So yes, we have to change um, the management practices and how we feed and what exactly we feed um, versus just giving another um, medicine, medication. And then your question about cellulose. Uh, yes, yeah, so I used to cut up strips of filter paper here because paper is virtually all cellulose. Uh, and actually, this Timothy hay would have a cellulose component. When you think about uh, plants, uh, the structural so st the structural component is a carbohydrate of cellulose. And so, if you're looking at a, a piece of grass, like what's keeping it standing up is it's basically cellulose. And as um, the plant matures and gets older, it's going to become more stemmy and harder, um, and that increases the cellulose. So. Um, in most of their forage diets, when they're eating grass or they're eating hay, that's where they're getting a lot of cellulose. And there's less starch there because those plants don't store as much glucose in this form. So I, what I was curious about is what is it that they're feeding horses that's high in cellulose um, for, for that energy? What would, what oh, would high in starch. Or starch, yes, okay. I'm sorry. What, what would that be? What would that look like? Yeah, so there's lots of feeds you can do. Uh, lots of different feed companies create concentrate diets that have high energy. And they use lots of different components, but some of the main things you'd look at are oats or perhaps corn. And corn is um, it's not ideal to feed doors, like it's high energy, but the form it's in um, just creates more of these problems, whereas oats is like slightly more accessible, so you can feed less, but get the right energy where you need it. Uh, so there's even like that shift in how you feed it, because all the plants are so different. So they're more like pellets or grains that you would feed them. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. I just had a, 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 a follow-up. Yes. I'll probably show my lack of creativity to you. Um, but uh, as a human uh, over a certain age with certain issues, um, I, I take a, a supplement every day that uh, puts the right kind of bacteria in my gut. So is there, is there any such thing for our, our equine friends? Yes, I take probiotics too. Everyone should look into them, they're great. Um, but yeah, that, that does already exist. People do use some probiotics, especially when you treat horses for problems with antibiotics, it completely disrupts right. even more like, than this, the horse's hind gut health. Um, so our next steps after using starch to, to uh, um, change the pH would be to see if we can mitigate this in vitro in the experimental setup with probiotics and prebiotics, which support bacteria. Um, but it'd also be a whole different ballgame in vivo in the actual horse, again, because I mentioned like the acidic environments here, and you have to find ways to encapsulate them so they get to where you want. And then we're also trying to discover there's so many species of bacteria. Uh, which ones are the best ones? Which ones do we want to supplement? Presumably Alltech is going to be funding your next research project. <laughs> they fund a lot of uh, our research, yeah, sure um, they do. and I think they're a very interesting company, for sure. <laughs> Hey, Miranda, I have one question yes. for you. As an equine owner, um, 
why did you decide on Timothy Hay and not alfalfa or an alfalfa mix? Yes. Um, so there's different types of hays that people feed, and they come from different plants. And her question is, why do we use this one, Timothy Hay, versus a different one, such as alfalfa or an orchard grass? And uh, for this study mainly, it was because we have used this sample many, many times for this process. And it was functioning in this experiment as like a control to see if our process was even working. Because um, with the nature of these bacteria and the feces, you could accidentally kill them, you couldn't be warm enough and transferring from the farm to the lab. And so we really wanna make sure that when we're getting these results for the cellulose, that those are accurate and reliable results. And so we just mostly needed a forage sample that we could rely on to be consistent. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you.